Welcome back to Good Log, Bad Law. My guest on today's episode is Brian Fitzpatrick. He is a professor at Vanderbilt Law School and the author of a new book called The Conservative Case for Class Actions. Now, as a lifelong conservative, clerking for Justice Scalia, going to Harvard Law School, a uh, member of the Federalist Society, this is not somebody you would automatically think of as a defender of class actions, that is of private enforcement uh, in our courts for corporate wrongdoing. But he gives the conservative case and it's a fascinating argument. Uh, I think everyone should uh, understand and uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. My conversation with Brian Fitzpatrick, a conservative in defense of class actions. Stay tuned. On today's episode, we're talking about class action lawsuits, and my guest today is someone you might not think would be necessarily in favor of class actions as a mechanism for bringing claims, particularly against big companies, Uh, but he is and lays out the case for class actions in a book called The Conservative Case for Class Actions, Brian Fitzpatrick a professor of law at Vanderbilt University and a self-described lifelong conservative. Brian, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, We met at a uh, continuing legal education conference a few weeks ago in New York City. Yes, lawyers do have to uh, engage in many hours each year in continuing legal education, but uh, this time it was uh, with the added benefit of getting a chance to meet Brian and hear about his book and uh, his uh, case uh, for class action. So I'm really pleased to have him on the program today. I'm very pleased to have you on the program, Brian. And uh, maybe we could start uh, by telling us a little bit about your own background, uh, both as a lawyer and a conservative, and how that brought you to this topic. Because again, as you yourself say in the introduction to your book, you're not the most obvious person, that is to say, a conservative is not the most obvious person to be writing in defense of class action. So I think that's a great place for us to start. Then we can get into some of the argument and some examples of class actions, both good and not so good. But maybe start by giving us some background on yourself, if if you would. Sure. Uh, You know, I have been a conservative Republican ever since I was in middle school or high school. You know, I used to read the magazine National Review as a kid. Yeah. And I've never voted for a Democrat for president in my entire life. I clerked for Justice Scalia after law school. And before I clerked for Justice Scalia, I clerked for maybe an even more conservative judge named Dermot O'Scanlan on the Ninth Circuit. Mm. I've been a member of the Federalist Society uh, ever since my first semester of law school. I'm still, you know, very active in the Federalist Society. I'm on the executive committee of the Federalist Society for the litigation practice area. And so, uh, you know, I consider myself in good standing on the right. Where did where did you go to law school, Brian? I went to Harvard, mm-hmm. um, and um, you know, I was to be honest with you, I was fairly notorious there as a conservative. Um, I recently did a, a debate on the book um, in Los Angeles, and one of my classmates, who's now a judge on the Ninth Circuit, Ken Lee, um, said at the beginning of the debate <laughs> that you know. <laughs> You hear a lot about people who are to the right of Attila the Hun. Well, I want to tell you all in law school, Brian really was to the right of Attila the Hun. <laughs> I wonder what Attila would have to say about that, but okay. Um, so, 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 and you teach at Vanderbilt Law School, a uh, great law school. How did you 
come to this particular topic in particular? Well, you know, I'll tell you that when I was in law school, um, I had a professor by the name of David Rosenberg. And he told us that if we wanted to go into litigation and we were studying anything other than class action, we were wasting our time. Mm. Because that's where all of the exciting action was. And so I took that to heart. And, you know, I practiced a, at a corporate law firm in D.C., Sidley Austin, where I defended companies against class actions. And when I got into private practice, I mean, excuse me, when I got into the academy, um, I, I wanted to continue studying class action lawsuits. And so it really was inspired by one of my professors. And, you know, I think like a lot of conservatives, especially when you cut your teeth on the defense side, I had a intuition that class actions were out of control and abusive. Um, but, you know, once I got into the academy and I started doing empirical work where I collected data about class actions, I really changed my mind about whether the class action system was working or not. And I, I, I have come to the conclusion, which I argue in, in, in the book, that our system is basically doing the right things. Hmm. Well, let's, let's, before we get into the conservative case for class actions, which is going to require us to, I think, understand better what we mean by a conservative, because that can mean different things to different people. Um, Tell us what a class action is exactly and how it differs from, say, what's, what many might think of as an ordinary lawsuit or a contract claim or a, uh, a tort claim that an individual or a company would bring against another individual or company or even the government. How is a class action different? Sure. Uh, the class action is different because the plaintiffs, the person who is suing the company, um, for example, who's the defendant, the person who is suing is allowed to represent not only themselves, but all other people who were injured in the same way by the company. So, you know, there's a process you have to go through to get certified by the judge as being an adequate representative for everybody else. But the power of the class action is that whatever happens in the lawsuit, whether good or bad, is going to bind everybody else who was injured by the defendant. So if the lawsuit fails, if, it, if the defendant wins a trial or on summary judgment, uh, then all of the people that were injured um, lose too, mm -hmm. even though you know they're not formally a part of the case. They're all bound by what happened. If the lawsuit wins and you get a bunch of money, then everybody else gets to share in that money. And so it's very powerful to have one person who gets to represent a bunch of other people who um, are not formally there, and, and some of them may not even know about the lawsuit. We're supposed to give everybody notice of the lawsuit and. If you're seeking money, you're supposed to have an opportunity to opt out. But sometimes you don't get the notice. And so people may not even know they're included in the lawsuit, but they are. And mm -hmm. that's what makes it very powerful and something that's very intimidating to a lot of corporations. And I think, you know, I think people have a lot of misconceptions about lawsuits generally. And in particular about class actions, uh, I, I think a lot of people imagine that uh, there are, you know, that our legal system is broken and all you have to do is is walk up to the courthouse and, you know, companies have to hand over, you know, trucks full of money. But actually, the requirements for showing a class action is a class action, which you, you mentioned briefly. Those rules are pretty are pretty rigid, actually. I, I've been involved in some class actions myself. I, I'm involved in one now against the makers of Juul, uh, the vape, uh, the very popular and hugely successful 
uh, uh, vaping uh, products uh, alleging fraud in particular in the way they targeted young people to to get them to buy vapes and, and become users of and and in many cases addicted to nicotine through the vape. And as a private attorney, you mentioned that you defended companies in class actions. And I imagine that a lot of the back and forth in that rep, in those representations involved these requirements that a plaintiff must show in order for a case to be uh, accepted as a class action. I mean, can you can you say something about that? What those requirements are, and how difficult it can be to meet those requirements? Absolutely, it is difficult. Um, you have to show uh, that as the plaintiff that you are a good representative for all the other class members, that you're going to vigorously pursue the case, that you don't have any conflicts of interest with other class members. You have to show that what happened to you is typical of what happened to everybody else. Um, and uh, you also have to, in, in cases where you're seeking money, you have to show that the issues that are in common, everybody else, you and everybody else, all those common issues, that those predominate mm -hmm. over all the little individual differences between you and the other class members. And you have to show that the class action is the best vehicle for, um, you know, redressing the harm. And mm -hmm. as you said, it can be very, very difficult to get a court to agree on every, you have to show every single one of those requirements are satisfied. If you failed one, you're out of the class action uh, realm. And so uh, it can be very difficult to show all those things and very expensive. You know, a good, you know, you can spend years just fighting with the defendant over whether you meet those requirements. And I know too, Brian, that <clears throat> if a plaintiff fails in any of those requirements, and if the judge who ultimately has to decide whether a case satisfies those requirements, um, if a plaintiff fails to have a case in the language of class actions, certified as a class, most often those cases go away. In other words, if, if they can't be brought as a class action, they can't be brought at all. Why, why is that? How, how do you explain that? That's a very good point. And the reason is this. If you can't certify as a class action, then the only person left in the case is the plaintiff that brought the case and who wanted to represent everybody else. But a lot of times, the amount of money that that plaintiff has been injured is very small. It mm -hmm. could be $1,000 or $500 or $100, and it is not worth it to keep fighting against a big company to try to recover $1,000 or $500 or $100. You need everyone in the case to make it worth investing millions of dollars of time and millions of dollars of expenses against a big company that's going to hire a big law firm to fight you, you have to have everyone in the case to make it worth anyone's while. Right. I mean, I know, for, for example, it, you know, let's take the example you gave. Someone has a, a claim or an injury worth $500, let's say. Uh, the filing fee just to file the lawsuit in the Court of Common Pleas, our state court, uh, here in Philadelphia is about five hundred dollars. So if your if your loss is only five hundred dollars, and just to get in the courthouse door, it costs you five hundred dollars. Well, I mean, right there you can see financially, it, it, it's just not a case that that has any chance of. You're going to lose more money just in the costs, not even getting to the lawyer time and that that would have to be invested. But if in a class there are a thousand people with five hundred dollar claims or ten thousand people with five hundred dollar claims, all of a sudden the 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 money aspects, the cost benefit aspects of the litigation change very dramatically. Yep, that's exactly right. So okay, then so here you are. You've 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 devoted yourself 
to being a conservative and have studied class actions, how, how, what is it? Well, I guess, first of all, what does it mean to say that you are a conservative and how do you relate that to, uh, to the world of class action lawsuits? Yeah, that's a good question. And, um, what I do in the book is I try to capture two different types of conservatives. And these are, I think, the most prominent types of conservative intellectual. And, you know, I mean, we can have a debate about whether the current Republican Party is very conservative. I have my doubts because mm -hmm. the current party has switched its position on a lot of things. But historically, the Republican Party and conservative intellectuals were on the same page. And this is basically what people believed. They believed in one camp, who I call kind of the more utilitarian conservatives. These are like the Milton Friedman of the world, a very famous economist from the University of Chicago, who really was an intellectual leader in the Republican Party for decades. Mm -hmm. These folks, they want um, resources to be allocated to their highest use. That's what they're interested in. They're interested in making sure that we create the most wealth in our society by allowing resources to find their way to their highest use. And um, these folks, these Milton Friedman folks, they believe in free markets because they believe that the market is the best mechanism to figure out how to get resources transferred to the people who can do the best with them. Mm -hmm. So I try to channel Milton Friedman utilitarian conservative. In the law, we often call these folks kind of the law and economics conservatives, people like Frank Easterbrook, Richard Posner. But it's also a lot, again, of these University of Chicago economists, Milton Friedman, Gary Becker, George Stigler. The other strand of conservative intellectualism that is very prominent on the right, at least until the current president, uh, is libertarian conservatives. These folks are less interested in getting resources to their highest use. These folks are more interested in keeping the government away from um, infringing upon people's freedoms and liberties. And so these are people like Friedrich Hayek um, and other you know, very prominent libertarians. Uh, and again, they also believe in markets because um, they think that markets uh, involve uh, free people deciding for themselves what to do every day instead of having, say, the government tell people what to do every day. So this is the intellectual tradition, these two traditions, really, that I try to channel in the book. And I try to show that whether you're a Milton Friedman conservative or you're a libertarian conservative, you should both think the class action is the right way to police our marketplace. And, and the alternative to that, I guess, would be a belief that the government should have involvement in regulating uh, transactions among individuals and, and among companies in the marketplace. And there's a, there's a general aversion to the idea of government being in that role, whether it's regulating or dictating or rule setting <clears throat> or anything else. Uh, and, and that would, I guess, apply either to the libertarian strand of conservatism or to the free market strand of conservatism, right? That, that is exactly right. There's basically only two alternatives to the class action lawsuit to police the marketplace. And, and I call the class action lawsuit private enforcement of the law. It is private citizens being represented by private lawyers holding companies accountable. Private enforcement of the law. There's really only two alternatives if we want to police our marketplaces. Alternative number one is no policing at all. 
Mm-hmm. So we could just let companies do whatever they want to do to us and say, oh, shucks, I won't do business with them again. And I try to show in one chapter of the book, an early chapter, no one takes that view. Even the most libertarian conservatives like Friedrich Hayek, they don't believe in no policing, no law. Everyone believes we need at least some legal constraints on what companies can do. So I, I throw out the no policing at all alternative very quickly. So then you're right. The only other viable alternative to private enforcement of the law is government enforcement of the law. And I just find it incredible that conservatives who are spending so much time and so much effort to criticize the government, limit the government, roll back the administrative state, roll back federal agencies. I mean, we are in the middle of a serious conservative legal effort to neuter federal agencies and not let them do all the things they've been doing. It just, it stuns me that the same people that are are trying to do all these things to limit the government and limit federal agencies, when it comes to class actions, say, oh, well, and with class actions, we should have federal regulation and not private enforcement of the law. It is totally inconsistent. And I, I, uh, I really take aim at the United States Chamber of Commerce in the book because the Chamber of Commerce takes <clears throat> that view. The Chamber of Commerce has said publicly, get rid of the class action and replace it with federal regulators. And I, it just is, it's head spinning for a true conservative to hear that. Yeah. Well, and why? Because, uh, the, I mean, you can understand why the U.S. Chamber of Commerce takes a position that I, I guess they view as pro-business. You know, it's not only an intellectual position of belief in free markets as the best way to uh, regulate, uh, you know, our, our conduct and our commerce and our economy, as well as our rights. But it's it's just straight up a pro business position. Uh, but you yourself are pro business, as you say in the book. So where is the disconnect? Do you think? I mean, b- b- beyond saying that it seems incongruous that the chamber would favor really any kind of federal regulation over private regulation, why do you argue that class actions with uh, lawyers who bring class actions and plaintiffs who uh, step up to be representative of other members of a, a, a similarly situated group of individuals. Why is private attorney general enforcement, which is what you're calling class actions, better than uh, federal regulation to correct for the bad acts of uh, companies when they engage in wrongful conduct? It's a good question, and I answer it this way. So, first of all, being pro free market is not the same thing as being pro business. And I start the book out with some very eloquent quotations from Milton Friedman on this very point. I support competitive marketplaces, as Milton Friedman did. Big businesses that are the members of the Chamber of Commerce. They don't like competitive marketplaces because they're big businesses. They're the winners in the current situation. They want to insulate themselves from competition. They don't want vibrant competition. It can only bring them down. And Milton Friedman said that over and over again. There's a wonderful quotation from him in the book where he says, we cannot trust. General Motors and General Electric to protect the free enterprise system. They wax poetic about it and then they go off on a plane to Washington, D.C. and ask for special legislation to help their companies. And that is why the private attorney general is better than federal regulators because federal regulators are biased. In law school, we call it agency capture. 
mm-hmm. in conservative circles. They call it crony capitalism. Companies go to federal agencies and they ask them for special privileges all the time. They want them to go hard on their competitors so that they can get a leg up over their competitors by using the government to try to go after uh, people that they are in competition with. They ask the government to look the other way when they do things that are wrong. I mean, how many of our federal agencies right now are being led by former lobbyists right. for these industries? <clears throat> or, uh, former exec- or former executives. I mean, you don't see very many environmental activists being asked to take the reins of the EPA, but you do see former coal executives, former energy company executives, and so on. I mean, the same with the, those agencies that regulate the banking industry, those agencies that regulate the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, and so on. I mean, that's you don't see ordinary citizens, the ones Milton Friedman say we must depend on to preserve a free market. You see big companies. Exactly regulating themselves. right. That's exactly right. We yeah. cannot trust federal agencies that are influenced by campaign contributions and the revolving door of personnel between industry and government. We cannot trust them to do even-handed policing of the marketplace. The private attorney general, for all of its failings, is independent of the people they're supposed to be policing. Well, and what, so, so why then... Uh, <clears throat> from an intellectual point of view, from a conservative mindset, uh, particularly when, and I've seen this so much in my practice over the last two and a half decades, I mean, the chamber has also targeted lawyers who bring all kinds of plaintiffs' claims in court, all kinds of measures to try to limit access to regulate fees that attorneys can earn in these kinds of cases. Uh, why, as a pro-business or pro-capitalist uh, conservative, do you see the class action uh, legal vehicle as a way to better regulate uh, corporate conduct and redress harms on people who suffer a loss because of some corporate uh, wrongful conduct. Why is that a better way, aside from the you know arguments about crony capitalism, which I you know I think everybody can understand as some kind of a wrong in and of itself? Uh, but why why do you see private enforcement through class action as a better way to regulate uh, situations where a company engages in some kind of wrongful conduct? It's a good question. And uh, the answer is, for all of the same reasons, we conservatives like the private sector for everything else. <laughs> I mean, there mm-hmm. has been a movement among conservatives since Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher's time to privatize, privatize, privatize. And I dive into that literature in the book and I mm-hmm. identify all of the distinct reasons why we believe the private sector is better at doing things in the government. And I apply all of those reasons to class actions, and I conclude every single one of the reasons why we normally want to privatize apply with equal force to class actions. We talked about one of them, and that's bias of the government, but there's Mm -hmm. some others. So, for example, what about the profit motive? We like the profit motive because we think the profit motive encourages people to do a better job than if you get a, a straight salary like government bureaucrats do, whether you do a good job or a bad job. Right. That is what our class action system does. The class action system says the following. If, 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 and only if you recover money for the victim, then you, the lawyer, get to share in that with a percentage of the recovery as your fee. The more you get for the victims, the more you get as the lawyer. This is a wonderful incentive to be aggressive, to be vigilant, 
and to do a good job. And, right. you know, if you compare the private class action lawyers to the government lawyers, do you find that the private lawyers recover many, many, many more times for victims, what the government does? Because right. the private lawyers have the fire in their belly because the more they get for the victims, the more they get for themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is the capitalist system. And well, so and that's another reason. Yeah. I, I, I want to add something back because I, I, as I mentioned, I've been a trial lawyer for almost 25 years. And what you're really talking about is the contingent fee system that is not only does a lawyer get a percentage of the recovery, but the flip side of that is also true. The lawyer gets nothing if there is no recovery, right? So the, the, the case is only one a lawyer ought to bring in the first place, unless there's a reasonable basis for the claim, because otherwise the lawyer gets nothing. And I've, I've made this argument, you know, throughout my career that uh, when we hear things like, oh, all, there's all these frivolous lawsuits and, and, and so on. Uh, and yes, there are. There are some really dumb cases that get filed. I, I shake my head uh, when I, there was one recently, I was really shaking my head over uh, a case where they were claiming that Dr. Pepper engaged in fraudulent advertising by calling <laughs> one of its products Diet Dr. Pepper. And the, the plaintiff had ended up gaining weight, even though drinking Diet Dr. Pepper. And I was like, oh my God, I can't even believe it. Uh, so I mean, clearly there are frivolous lawsuits, but I say all the time, if I'm filing frivolous lawsuits, um, I'm not going to be in business for very long. I have, to, I have to bring cases that I believe are meritorious. And so it's not only the profit motive, I think, but it's also a way of limiting litigation, actually, because uh, but for that system, you'd, you'd bring cases uh, that were frivolous all the time. That's exactly right. It's a wonderful way to screen out good cases from bad is by asking the lawyer, do you really want to invest your time and money in this thing? Because if you don't get anything, then you're going to end up with zero fees. And of course, there are some stupid lawyers that file stupid cases. We have one million lawyers in this country, and there's going to be some dumb ones. But we have lots of corporate executives in this country, too. And there's some dumb corporate executives as well. Right. So, I mean, we don't we're there's going to be some frivolous cases to get through the system. And there's right. going to be some very bad things that corporate executives do, too. We're not alone in that regard as, as lawyers. Um, but I agree with you that if you look at the data, which I do in the book in one of the chapters, I found it very hard to find many frivolous class action cases. It, it's a small, small percentage of class action cases are ones that most people would call frivolous. And well, how did, that's uh, fascinating, Brian. So, so how, how did you look at the data or, or what data did you look at rather and how did you analyze that data to arrive at that conclusion? Good question. So I, I look at a few things. So number one, I look at how often corporate defendants are able to dismiss a putative class action on a motion to dismiss. Mm -hmm. Now, as I often say to my students at Vanderbilt, it has never been easier in American history to dismiss a lawsuit on a motion to dismiss. The Supreme Court has decided these two cases, which I know you're very familiar with, Twombly and Iqbal. Right. And they have basically given a green light to federal judges to kick out of court any claims that the court believes are implausible. We have never had a standard like that until the last 10 years. So this is the easiest it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And if you look, look at the motion dismiss rates, it's a small minority of putative class actions that are dismissed on a motion to dismiss. And not all those cases are frivolous, by the way. There are legitimate, good faith disagreements about how the law should be interpreted. And sometimes the judge interprets the law against you on a motion to dismiss. It doesn't mean the case wasn't a good case. It just right. means that, you know, you 
you lost a 50-50 coin flip that day. Right. So the motion dismiss rate is the high watermark on frivolousness, and it's already a small minority of cases. Now, sometimes I hear the corporations say, well, we don't file the motion to dismiss because it costs too much money. And so instead, we just settle the frivolous cases. And so one thing I, I did, I said, okay, well, let's look. Let's look at what the judges do when they ward attorney's fees in class action cases. Because if there were all these frivolous cases that were being settled to avoid the you know, litigation expenses, uh, wouldn't our most conservative federal judges, Republicans, wouldn't they be punishing the class action lawyers in those cases by giving them small fee awards? And what I find in the data is there's no difference, no statistically significant difference at all between Republican judges awarding fees and Democrat judges awarding fees. The exact same fees are awarded no matter who appointed the judge. And so I just doubt that there's mm. this big group of frivolous cases because the Republican judges, the ones that are most sympathetic to the defendants, are not punishing class action lawyers for them. And then the last thing I look at, and this is more annex data than data, I have to admit, but it was fun to do, is I look at these lists that the United States Chamber of Commerce puts out every year, the 10 most frivolous cases filed in America. They put these lists out. I looked at five years of lists, so 50 of the most frivolous cases in America, according to the U.S. Chamber. And how many class actions are on the list? There were 10 class actions on the list of, of, of 50 cases. And I look at those cases in depth to see, okay, how bad were these cases? And some yeah. of them were bad, I have to admit. There were three or four cases that I agree are frivolous. There was a subway footlong case where- Oh my God, I remember that one. You know, bad, yeah, you know, some of the subways were only 11 inches. Um, and so there was a consumer fraud <laughs> class action about that. Okay. <laughs> and then there was, there was a couple of Starbucks cases too, but most of the cases on the chamber's own list of the most frivolous cases in America were pretty good cases, at least debatable, if not sound cases. And so what I say in the book is this. I say, listen, if the United States Chamber of Commerce cannot find more than four class actions in five years that are frivolous, then we don't have a problem with frivolous cases in our system. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Brian, the other side of that, too, is, uh, I mean, you say sometimes it's a coin toss whether a case is going to uh, be certified as a class action or will be dismissed. Um, sometimes, and, and I, I don't know how you would uh, gather the data to support this, because you really have to look at every case individually and on its own terms. But but certainly we know, I mean, I've seen in my practice, I'm sure you saw in your private practice and, and have seen in, in your research, there are cases, uh, perhaps many cases that are filed that have a very strong uh, basis, at least on, on its face, uh, that for some reason or another do end up getting dismissed. It doesn't mean that the case was frivolous. Um, you know, there are all kinds of issues of evidence. There are these very rigid rules we talked about, uh, you know, that apply to potential class actions. There are a whole variety of reasons why a case could be dismissed besides it being frivolous to begin with. Um, and many companies, because they have a lot of resources to devote to defending themselves in court, in class actions, and in other cases, um, hiring many of the best lawyers at the big firms in D.C. or New York or L.A. or wherever, uh, many cases do get dismissed uh, on a motion to dismiss or, or on summary judgment uh, either way. So, <clears throat> I mean, we tend to hear about the extreme cases, but most of what goes on is in the middle. You know, we don't really hear as much about that. You're exactly right about that. And that is an important point. And that is the chamber and the news media 
yeah. focuses our attention on the extreme. And we get a unrepresentative picture of our system if we do that. And that's why I try to bring a lot of data to bear on these questions. And just to add an exclamation point to what you just said about there's lots of reasons why cases can get dismissed. You're absolutely right about that. As you know, there's jurisdictional questions. There's right. all kinds of technical procedural matters that you may fail, even though the case has a lot of merit. And just right. as an example, one of the frivolous, and I put that in quotation marks, yeah. cases on the chamber's list was this case against MasterCard, where MasterCard was running a promotion that said, if you use your MasterCard, we will donate a percentage of your purchases to charity. Mm. But MasterCard didn't tell people that the amount of money they were going to get to charity was capped. And they hit the cap in month three of the year, and they kept running the promotion on TV, saying, use your card, we're donating percentage to charity. It wasn't true anymore, because they had reached the cap months ago. Right. So someone sued for consumer fraud. I think that is a at least debatable claim, but the case was dismissed but it had nothing to do with the merits. It was dismissed on standing grounds. The plaintiff could not show standing to the company. That's a very technical procedural requirement. It had yeah. nothing to do with the validity of the claim. Fascinating. Well, wow. So, I mean, I'm curious, what, what response or reaction have you had to the book? Obviously, you continue to be active in, uh, as you mentioned, in the Federalist Society, probably the leading uh, conservative legal organization on law school campuses and even uh, in in law practice today and in the academy today. What, what type of reaction are you receiving as you talk to fellow conservatives uh, and, and get reaction from, from fellow conservatives to this argument? So I am, I'm getting two reactions um, when I go about uh, the country talking about the book. Number one, people agree with me that private enforcement of the law is better than the government. I, I, there is still a very powerful anti-government strain in our, in our conservative movement. They understand all the arguments for privatization. They understand there's nothing wrong with lawyers having a profit motive any more than any other actor having a profit motive. So I get a lot of support on the theory for private enforcement. I do get more pushback on is the system as it stands working now. And I do try in the book to meet the Chamber of Commerce halfway by proposing some tweaks and changes to our system to tighten things up a bit. So let me just give you some examples. So, you know, I don't think we have a big problem as we discussed with meritless cases, but I, but I say in the book, listen, if it will make the chamber happy, I'm willing to make it even harder to bring a frivolous case than it is now. And so one thing I propose in the book is I say, listen, if you file defendant a motion to dismiss, discovery should be stayed in the case until the motion to dismiss is decided. Mm. Most judges already do that, some don't. If you don't stay discovery, then the defendant is racking up a lot of bills with their lawyers waiting around for maybe a meritless case to be dismissed. And so I say, okay, let's make discovery stay automatic. Well, well ex explain that for, for the non-lawyer listeners. I obviously know what you mean by that, but explain what that means and why, when a judge doesn't stay discovery in that situation, why that can result in a huge expense. Yeah, so um, this, after you file your lawsuit, if it's not dismissed, the next stage in the lawsuit is called discovery, and it is the most expensive part of litigation. It is where the parties exchange all relevant information about the case to each other. And um, you can also depose uh, witnesses under oath about the case. 
it's very expensive for companies because companies have a lot of data, mm -hmm. emails and other documents. And they have to look through all these things to find the things that are relevant to the lawsuit. And so, honestly, it, it does cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in some cases, to go through discovery. Right. So if the judge is mulling over a motion to dismiss, meaning the judge might end up dismissing this entire case, if the judge is mulling it over but discovery goes on, the defendants are paying thousands and thousands of dollars every month to their lawyers for a case that could go away. So, well, I mean, they obviously don't like that, and I understand that. And they um, sometimes will say, you know, we have no choice but to settle at this point. We're not going to pay our lawyers $2 million if we can settle the case for $1 million. Right, exactly. And, and so that kind of practice of not staying discovery can encourage lawyers to file meritless cases because they might be able to get a settlement, um, what we call a nuisance settlement, where the company just settles to avoid the cost of litigation. So, you know, I understand this, and I'm willing to make the discovery stay automatic just to make sure that doesn't happen. I mean, I have to say, as a plaintiff's lawyer, I, I mean, I think in many, many cases, that's very reasonable. Um, and And if there are lawyers who think that they're going to get a quick nuisance settlement by in effect holding a gun to the head of some company um, who may face a huge expense in discovery on a case that is likely to be dismissed or at least has a credible argument for dismissal. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I think that is an enormously reasonable request. I, I find many judges do that already, but to make sure that it's more widely applied. I mean, I, I think that's a totally fair compromise. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're making progress. We're making progress. <laughs> <laughs> and you have other suggestions too that, that that are worth considering and are worth debating. But the you, you have to start with a with a with a a fundamental agreement on principles, and that's what I think you do so effectively and why this isn't just a case for class actions, but a conservative case for it, because you're really challenging the fundamental principles of those who've tried to put unreasonable, your proposal is quite reasonable, I think, but there are many unreasonable barriers that have been raised uh, to, uh, to, to class actions and other forms of, of civil uh, litigation too. And I think that's I think that's what is so such a big contribution uh, that you've made to this. And, and uh, I, I, I think the book isn't just about class actions. I mean, that's obviously what we're talking about in detail, but it really is about uh, our legal system, our economy, the, the different roles between government and, and private enforcement of, uh, you know, in, in cases of wrongful conduct. I mean, any any citizen, I think, ought to understand these issues because it really is about how how we uh, deal with these issues when they come up and uh, how we deal with them fairly and justly. Um, so I, I I I really appreciated the book. Um, I've enjoyed reading it. I'm, we'll we'll post a link to it uh, in the description for this episode, Brian. It is. Um, uh, University of Chicago Press, quite appropriately, given given what you've been talking about, uh, the conservative case for class actions, and and I really re strongly recommend it to everybody. Uh, and want to thank you, Brian Fitzpatrick, very much for being on Good Law Bad Law and sharing your your thoughts on this important topic. Well, I had a wonderful time, and uh, I'm just so pleased that you invited me, and I look forward to. Uh, keeping in touch and continuing these discussions. I hope we will. It'd be great. Thank you.